Hi, I'm Mark Elliott and I'm going to be talking in this video about the Miller One uh, case. This is part of a series of explainers for the Constitutional Law Matters project on controversial constitutional law cases. So the Miller One case was brought in 2016 um, after the referendum on leaving the European Union. The central question in the case was about how it was possible for the government to initiate the formal legal process by which the UK would leave the European Union. The process for leaving is set out in Article 50 of the Treaty on European Union. And the key issue in the case was whether the government could unilaterally trigger that um, process under Article 50 or whether before doing so, it would need to be authorised by Parliament, by means of Parliament enacting legislation. Now, one of the issues uh, in the case concerns the nature of the Article 50 process and, and the consequences of triggering Article 50. All that I need to say for the purpose of this uh, video is that while there were uh, various uh, questions about whether, for example, Article 50, once triggered, could be uh, untriggered. Um, the, the key issue uh, for our purposes is that once Article 50 is triggered, the default effect of doing that is that the state that invokes it leaves the European Union two years later. Another uh, key point in the case concerned the nature of what's called prerogative power. Again, I don't need to go into a lot of detail in this video, but for our purposes, prerogative power is uh, powers that the government uh, holds, uh, which are not given to it by Parliament. So the majority of powers that the government has are provided to it through legislation enacted by uh, Parliament. But over a small range of matters, including importantly for this case, international relations, the government has powers that are independent of Parliament or not conferred by Parliament, and we call those powers prerogative powers. So the central question in the case was whether the Article 50 process could be triggered uh, unilaterally without the need for an act of Parliament. There was also a second question uh, in the case which concerned whether or not the devolved legislatures uh, could in effect, uh, prevent the triggering of Article 50 by declining to consent. I'll start with that point and then I'll return to uh, the Article 50 uh, point about prerogative power and legislation, uh, which is the issue that I want to focus on in this uh, video. So we might wonder, well, why, why might the devolved legislatures be able to uh, have uh, an input into this? Uh, beyond the, the obvious political fact that, that, that Brexit uh, would have and, and, and indeed has had enormous implications for the whole of the UK, including its devolved nations, there's also a more technical reason that was in play in the Miller case. And this concerns something called the Sewell Convention. Uh, we have a, an explainer on the Constitutional Law Matters website about uh, constitutional conventions, of which the Sewell Convention uh, is an example. Constitutional conventions are not laws, they're rather uh, practices uh, which are usually followed and which there is an expectation will be uh, followed. A political expectation though, as distinct from a legal requirement. The Sewell Convention says that um, the UK Parliament, that is the Parliament in Westminster, will normally legislate on devolved matters only with the consent of the devolved legislature concerned. Now in uh, Miller, uh, it was argued that uh, Brexit and therefore triggering Article 50, the default effect of which would be Brexit two years later, it was argued that Brexit would impact on devolved matters uh, because it would affect the arrangements for uh, devolution. Uh, prior to uh, the UK leaving the EU, European Union law was a limitation on the powers of the devolved uh, legislatures and governments. Uh, leaving the European, European Union would necessarily uh, remove European Union law uh, as uh, a constraint. And in that sense, 
it would affect devolution arrangements, uh, it would therefore affect evolved matters, and so it was said it would trigger the Sewell Convention. So one of the questions in the case was, well, what would be the consequences if the devolved uh, legislatures uh, declined to grant consent, or, or conversely, uh, was it correct that the Sewell Convention did in effect uh, require the default legislatures to consent uh, before uh, the UK could leave the EU um, and the necessary, legis necessary legislation uh, be enacted. This anticipates the point I'm going to go on to, uh, which is that uh, legislation, the court said, was indeed required. Well, on this point, the Supreme Court um, declined to rule. It said that the Sewell Convention was a political convention, uh, that it wasn't legally enforceable, and that it therefore wasn't for the court to determine uh, this issue. Now, there are, there are many uh, arguments uh, for and against that the view that the court took. I'm not going to go into those in any detail um, in this uh, talk. But I just underline the point that the court, um, having decided that the Sewell Convention was a political convention, then declined to uh, de 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 determine the matter um, any further. And that's a point that I'll come back to at the end of this talk when we consider uh, whether or not the uh, the court, uh, the charges against the Supreme Court and indeed the divisional court, which heard the uh, Miller case to begin with, whether the argument that they, uh, the judges uh, interfered in politics is an argument that actually um, holds water. Certainly in terms of the handling of the devolution and the Sewell Convention issue, it seems clear that once the court recognised that the matter was a political one, a matter of political convention, not law, the court was assiduous uh, in, in not uh, intervening. In reality, the criticism uh, that the court interfered in politics it is really reserved for its handling of the other aspect of the case. And that concerns the the question of whether or not it was uh, permissible legally for the government to trigger Article 50 uh, on its own using prerogative power rather than getting Parliament to trigger Article 50 or to legislate to authorise the government to trigger Article 50. So the claimant in Miller argued that uh, legislation was required and that unilateral prerogative action by the government was not permissible. Why did the claimant argue this? Well, it was said that the European Communities Act, which is the legislation enacted to facilitate um, UK membership of what became the EU uh, when the UK joined back in 1973, it was argued that the EC Act 1972 conferred European Union law rights on people in the UK. As we've already said, the default consequence of triggering um, Article 50 would be exit from the European Union two years later, and hence the removal of those rights. Of course, it was always possible, and indeed certain steps were taken to uh, to, to sort of moderate uh, the legal effects of, of Brexit, but the default consequence would be uh, departure from the EU and the, 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 the evaporation, if you like, of all of the rights that accrued uh, through um, the, the direct effect of uh, European Union law in the UK, through both the combination of Brexit and the repeal of the domestic legislation, the EC Act, that uh, was the domestic uh, basis for um, EU membership. It was further argued that rights that had been granted by Parliament in this way, by enacting the EC Act back in 1972, that rights that had been granted by Parliament in this way could not lawfully be taken away by unilateral government action. And this really rested on a fundamental um, argument that the prerogative, the royal prerogative, these unilateral powers that the government has are in effect legally inferior to acts of Parliament, that once Parliament has legislated on a matter such as to, to grant EU law rights to people in the UK, the government can't use its unilateral prerogative powers to in effect undermine that legislation by taking away 
the EU law rights that Parliament has legislated to grant. So what did the UK government say in response to this um, argument? The government said that triggering Article 50 was centrally concerned with the UK's international relations. It was concerned with its relations with other European Union member states and with the European Union itself as an international organisation. Now, there is no doubt that the government does have a prerogative power to conduct international relations. And so there are, there are many things the government can do on the international plane uh, as it conducts business on behalf of the United Kingdom that it can do and that it does do under the prerogative power uh, to conduct international relations without the need for legislation enacted by Parliament. The government argued um, that, um, that this was one of those situations that Article 50 engaged questions of international relations and therefore it could be triggered using the royal prerogative to conduct international relations. But what about this argument that the claimant had made that the prerogative can't be used to undermine Acts of Parliament? Well, said the government, that, uh, that contention was really beside the point because it misunderstood the legal effect and the legal um, architecture of the EC Act 1972. The government's argument was, the e was that the EC Act did not guarantee that anybody in the UK would have EU law rights in perpetuity. Rather, said the government, the EC Act merely gave legally effect to those rights in the UK while the UK remained a member state. But that the EC Act on this view was agnostic about whether the UK should remain a member state. So the argument essentially was that there was no difficulty in using the prerogative to trigger Article 50 and to begin a process that would result by default in the removal of EU law rights, because to begin with, the EC Act did not guarantee that people would retain those rights for any particular period of time. It was just a legal conduit for granting those rights to people in the UK while the UK happened to remain a member of the European Union. On this central question about whether legislation was required to authorise the triggering of Article 50, the Supreme Court by a majority found for the government. The Supreme Court held uh, that European Union law uh, had become part of and was a source of uh, UK law. It followed that removal of EU law from the UK legal system and from UK citizens and others was not, was not therefore a matter of international relations because it engaged central matters of UK domestic law. Moreover, the majority held that in enacting the EC Act 1972, Parliament had intended uh, the UK to be a member of the EU and that it hadn't intended the government to be able to unilaterally remove the UK from the EU, thereby potentially stripping uh, those in the UK of their EU law rights. The court also said that leaving the EU was such a major constitutional change that the royal prerogative could not be used to accomplish it, that to achieve a constitutional change of this degree of magnitude uh, required the enactment by Parliament of legislation. Now the minority judgments, the judgments of the three judges who uh, disagreed with the majority obviously took a different uh, view. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that except to say that uh, in essence um, the, the minority judges largely uh, accepted uh, the, the essence of the government analysis which I set out um, uh, in an earlier uh, slide. So the minority judges took the view that the European Communities Act uh, did not uh, have anything legally significant to say about the permanency or anything similar of UK membership of the EU, but rather that the, e that the EC Act 
1972, merely operated to facilitate uh, the, the, the sort of the enjoyment of EU law derived rights in the UK for as long as the UK remained a, a member state. On my view, that is the, the more compelling uh, legal um, analysis, uh, albeit that I recognise that um, there, is, there is also a, a, a great deal of support, uh, including among uh, lawyers and legal scholars for the majority um, analysis. What, one further point that I would make in relation to the majority's view is this idea that um, major constitutional changes can only be accomplished through enacting Acts of Parliament is an entirely uh, novel uh, view um, and uh, is not one that is very easy to apply. For one thing, it's very difficult to know uh, on this approach when a constitutional change would be uh, so big or so major that it would need uh, primary legislation, an Act of Parliament, to um, accomplish it. So, so my, my own view is that there are difficulties with the uh, majority uh, judgments, um, uh, but there is also a great deal of support for it, um, and clearly uh, that's the view that the, the court took. The consequence of that uh, was not that Brexit couldn't happen. Of course, Brexit uh, has happened. The consequence was simply that in order to begin the formal legal uh, Brexit process under Article 50 of the Treaty on European Union, it was necessary for the, uh, the government to ask Parliament to enact legislation. Parliament did that uh, very shortly after the Miller One uh, judgment. Um, and that, that legislation was a very simple piece of legislation, a very short piece of legislation, which authorised the triggering by the government of Article 50. Let me conclude then by asking why is this case so uh, controversial and does it deserve to be uh, as controversial as it is? Um, so why is it controversial? Well, it, it certainly is controversial when the divisional court, the lower court, issued its judgment in this case and, and the lower court also held, uh, like the Supreme Court, that legislation was required. Um, there was a now infamous uh, newspaper headline uh, carrying uh, photographs of the judges and describing them as the enemies of the people. The implication was that the judges were interfering in politics, they were undermining the will of the people as expressed in the referendum, and perhaps even trying to, to block Brexit. That the narrative was that, that judges were sort of out of touch uh, members of uh, a liberal elite uh, who uh, didn't accept the outcome of the referendum and were seeking to, to thwart it through these clever uh, legal arguments. Are those criticisms fair? In my view, they absolutely are not uh, fair. And I say that even though, um, as a lawyer, as a legal scholar, I think the Supreme Court got the decision wrong. Um, as I've explained, um, my view is that the, the minority uh, judgments in uh, the Miller case are more legally um, persuasive, for reasons that I mentioned very briefly uh, in an earlier slide. But in spite of the fact that I think that on balance, the legal arguments um, show that the, the contrary conclusion should have been reached by the Supreme Court, um, I absolutely don't think that it's fair or uh, warranted in any way to react to the case, as some commentators did uh, in the press um, and as some uh, politicians did. So why do I say that? Well, the reason that I say that is that the issues before the court were very clearly confined to questions of law, as is right and proper. The reason why some people like me think the court got it wrong is not because I think that the court interfered in something that was none of its business, not because the court was trying to do politics, far less to undermine the referendum or to block Brexit. I simply think that on the very technical 
questions that arose in the case about constitutional law, uh, the interpretation of the EC Act, and the implications of all of that for the use of the royal prerogative. I think that the arguments put forward by the government and preferred by the minority judges were stronger legal arguments than the ones that were put forward for the claimant and which were ultimately accepted by the majority uh, judges. Answering these sorts of legal questions is what the courts are there to do. Um, it's not no surprise that when a case gets as far as the, as the Supreme Court, we find that there are different views in play. Cases only get to the Supreme Court if they raise particularly difficult and particularly important questions of law. The fact, therefore, that legal scholars disagree about this case and the fact that the judges who decided it took different views is no surprise. But those disagreements are about the interpretation and the application of the law. Whether or not the law required an act of parliament before Article 50 could be triggered was clearly and in every relevant sense a question of law. Yes, it was a question of law that had enormous political consequences um, and that was a very highly politically charged question in the sense of the debate that was surrounding it. But strip all of that away and it was a question of law. And so my view certainly is that charges of interfering in politics or undermining the referendum are misplaced. If this case is controversial, uh, it's deservedly controversial in terms of the analysis of the law because there are strongly held views on each side. But there is no scope for genuine controversy about whether this was an appropriate issue for the court to be deciding. It was a legal question and courts are there to answer legal questions.